Welcome to the Data Strategy Show. My name's Samir Sharma and I'll be your host for the next 60 minutes. My guest today is Anne K. Emery. She's an internationally acclaimed speaker who equips organizations to get their data out of dusty spreadsheets and into real world conversations. Each year she delivers over 50 keynotes, workshops and webinars with the aim of equipping organizations to visualize data more effectively. She has been invited to speak in more than 30 states and 10 countries. More than 3,200 people have enrolled in her online training academy and she has consulted to more than 150 organizations, including the United Nations, Centers for Disease Control and Harvard University. She earned a bachelor's degree from the University of Virginia and a master's degree from George Mason University. When Anne's not on site with clients, she resides in Florida along with her husband, and two daughters. I hope you enjoy this podcast and please do leave your comments. Thank you. Anne Emery, thank you very much for coming on to the Data Strategy Show. It's such a delight to have you on the show today. Um, why don't you say hello to the guests? Hi, I'm Anne Emery. I run Depict Data Studio and thank you so much for having me. That's, uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure, an absolute pleasure. Listen, I'd really like to just start off with asking you, um, a little bit about your background and how you've come from where, where you started, I believe, in research to depict Data Studio. And just, just tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so I started my career in a pretty traditional research setting. You know, I graduated college and I went on to work with some of my professors. So I worked on, you know, longitudinal studies of adolescent development in university wow. funded projects. Like it basically meant I was doing SPSS data entry all day. Uh -huh. Or okay. a little bit of SAS coding here and there, yep. and churning out peer-reviewed journal articles. So kind of traditional social sciences research. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then after that, I went to work at a consulting firm and in a nonprofit and worked with foundations. But over the course of, you know, a few jobs after that, a natural part of my job was attending conferences and speaking at conferences. And I think I got really lucky, to be honest. Okay. Um, Kind of in the right place at the right time. My first or maybe second conference presentation ever was about dashboards. Okay. A decade ago when dashboards was, that was the buzzword, mm -hmm. you know, it's the buzzword now. Data science. Or AI. AI. Yeah. A couple <laughs> years ago it was like infographics. Yes. Infographics. Yes, it was. So yes. I just happened out of sheer, you know, luck and chance mm -hmm. to give a presentation about dashboards when dashboards were the thing. And mm -hmm. I didn't know, uh, you know, I, I had no idea. It was one of my first conferences I'd ever attended. And it was a standing room only conference wow. uh, you know, session. People were mm -hmm. sitting in aisles and people were sitting in the front, not to hear me. Nobody, nobody knew who little old <laughs> Anna was. They didn't care about dashboards. And I immediately that afternoon got emails from people saying, that was amazing. Can we oh, fly wow. our company? And you give that same talk. Better yet, do you have a half day workshop or a full day workshop more than just your, your 45 minute version? So I was working, but also doing my grad school master's degree at night. So I didn't yep. have a lot of time. I was, it was a miserable few years doing I that. Yeah. Uh, it was absolutely terrible. I didn't have any free time. But then as soon as I graduated, my schedule cleared up and I was mm -hmm. like, well, maybe I should do some of these training opportunities that I really enjoy. I love, I love doing the data work. Mm -hmm. But the training piece is really absolutely my favorite sure. thing in the whole world. Um, so I started, you know, doing some of those speaking gigs and, and workshops. And I, I just kind of realized, like, well, what if I just, what if I just did this full time mm -hmm. instead of doing my regular job mm -hmm. and um, made the decision fairly quickly, you know, and, and that was that. So I'm actually in year seven now of working for Great. myself and running my own data viz training company. Yeah. Fantastic. So there's one thing about um, Depict Data Studio that I like, and it's on the front. It's right on the front page when you get there. It says, "Transform your spreadsheets into stories," and I, I I like the idea of that because I I really can't stand Excel. So I think for me it's one of those things which I I whenever I see anything done in Excel, I'm like, oh no. Um, so, so, you know, you've obviously, you know, being from a, that research background and doing SAS and SPSS and so on, 
that's very um, you, you need to have a narrative, you need to display that you understand the data really deeply and, and are able to articulate um, the essence of that, but, but equally tell a story. So when, when you work with somebody, and I'm, you know, people are in, in Excel heaven, as far as I'm concerned, in every industry, and, and they always will be. What are, the th what, what are the typical data visualization challenges that you, you often come up against and um, that are reoccurring problems that you've seen for the last seven years? Gosh, okay, where do we start? So <laughs> many, um, Top first, three then, top you, three maybe. Yeah, let me ask you first though, yeah. um, what's your tool of choice if you're not a Excel spreadsheet person? Well, um, I'm not a, a technical, uh, uh, I'm not in the technical, you know, um, I, I don't want to say, uh, I'm not in the technical realms, basically. I'm, I'm not a, I sort of do a lot of strategy work um, and we've got teams who do the um, implementation side. I've got data visualization uh, 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 people. We've got data scientists, data engineers, data analysts. So um, I'm the person going out and, and working with the client at a strategic perspective, and then the, the teams are mobilized to absolutely implement. So we might be using, dependent, it's, you know, uh, whatever the client is, um, is, is using. So it might be Power BI, it might be Tableau, it might be Click, um, it may be Looker, it may be some of the other applications. Um, but traditionally, I think, you know, you're looking at those three. Now we always have Excel. Absolutely, in the mix. Most clients are still, but they do want to come away from that um, dependency as much as they can and as much as they can forcibly control it, um, let's say. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not the person who will be doing the, the, the development on any visualization. I, I will, however, be thinking about what the, 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 the business want to achieve from that that visualization and I come at it from a very much a decision based, um, a decision intelligence world. So I would be saying, what types of decisions do you want to, to make based on this data? What are the business questions that you're attempting to answer? Shall we design what it would look like? And so on, and then that's handed. And obviously, you know, the data, the developers are in the room as well, but that's more of the strategic side. And then out pops a, a visualization from the team and and so so yes it's a that that's that's what i do so um i hope that answers your question <laughs> would you describe yourself as tool agnostic or yes. software yes okay yes okay yes i feel like that for other people i don't care what tool they use i'm a spreadsheet user okay. i um i use excel and sheets a lot now but i actually grew up my dad was an economist or still is an economist. right he's we we have conversations over Christmas dinner of like, oh, I was coding this thing in SAS. I'm like, oh, I remember doing that in my grad <laughs> class. Uh, so he, you know, Brilliant. back in the nineties, I don't know when Excel came to be, but he taught me some Lotus one, two, three. Oh yes. Yeah. Tricks. yeah. And not yeah. big things like shortcuts for copying and pasting or how to do a mm -hmm. sum or, you know, little mm -hmm. things a kid can understand that. Sure. Not big, big things. Um, okay, spreadsheets. Gosh, yeah, it's so tricky because I I love spreadsheets. I've been using spreadsheets forever and ever, so they come so easy. Naturally, yeah. But I think you know that's that's not the case for most people. Most people sure. don't be in spreadsheets. Yeah. At all. So I think your perspective is mm -hmm. by far the most common, and I'm like the oddball here who not only do I not mind spreadsheets, but I'm like, ooh, I get to play with numbers today. Mm -hmm. hey my favorite thing in the world to do. Um, I think a big challenge I see with organizations, and I should specify too, I'm, I work with um, not all government, sure. but a lot of the groups of I mean happen to be federal governments, state governments, local, you know, city and county government staff. Mm -hmm. I work with a lot of foundations who are managing projects and mm -hmm. managing grants. Mm -hmm. Some of them are in spreadsheets all day, sure. every day. Not really. They're more like on the strategy side, the big yep. picture thinking side. Mm -hmm. um, a challenge I see is the people with data backgrounds like me. I think it's so easy for us to forget that not everybody is a data person. Sure. You know, just because Absolutely. I 
playing in Excel, I have to constantly remind myself, most people hate spreadsheets. Most people, like they see that as a chore and a burden and it's just overly detailed and they can't find what they need. And I think that's because a lot of us are trained. You're in this little bubble. You're in your, your, your college or university program mm-hmm. or if you go to a graduate program or if you go into a specialized role in a company where you're around other kind of data science people. Sure. We're all speaking the same language yep. all the time, using mm-hmm. the same button. And then it, it goes to communicate with the leaders who actually need to make decisions based on the data. And it's just so easy for us to forget that they yes. have different priorities. Like they're not thinking about, I wonder if there are outliers in the data. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if this is statistically significant, like yes. that's NA to mm-hmm. their work. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of times they're thinking more about what types of budgeting decisions should I make on this? Do I need Correct. to change staffing? Do I need to change the entire project we're working mm-hmm. on? Because mm-hmm. it's like, what action should I do next? And those are like such separate groups of people. So that's that's tricky. If you're trained in the weeds and the details like I was, and like you're never exposed to those business leaders. Sure. And, oh, now you're in a company and you have to deal with, like you have no training on how to actually work with those people necessarily. Yeah. So when was the first time that you came up against that and you said, oh, okay, so I'm just doing my stuff. And then suddenly somebody says, well, you know, I just don't get what you know what it is. And I, I guess that's where I come from. It's a point of, look, there's, a, there, there, there's always going to be a, a, a technical data specific language. And there's always going to be this business language. And I'm, I'm sort of the hybrid that brings those two together, as I'm mm-hmm. sure are you, um, you know, when you're working. But wh- wh- how, did you, how did you come about that point where you said, oh, wow, this is actually, I'm, 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 you know, I'm not saying the right things or, you know, did somebody hit you on the head and say, look, I don't understand what the hell you're saying. I'm just laughing because I have a couple very distinct memories that come to okay. mind. Oh, right. I'm debating whether to tell you the embarrassing <laughs> one or the um, appropriate for a public oh, facing podcast. It, it doesn't matter whichever one you think, whichever one you want. I'm going to cross my fingers that my old supervisor from a decade ago is not listening to this. <laughs> so, um, I okay so I worked in a university research center I was in my bubble peer-reviewed journal articles statistical Mm -hmm. p-values blah 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 Mm -hmm. formal language and then I went to work in a large consulting firm working with mostly federal government agencies and the bubble because our team of 10 or 20 people it was all people with you know master's degrees and PhDs Mm -hmm. like people with Mm -hmm. statistician in their title very technical right well, my next job after that was completely different. I went to work in a nonprofit um, as an internal data analyst. So okay. five of us for 250 staff members. Okay. So it's like completely flip-flopped of yes. what type of people yeah. you're dealing with. So I was responsible for helping our, our board of directors understand the data, mm-hmm. or executive director, you know, the, the key leaders to see what should we do? How can we serve our communities better? And I distinctly remember being in the executive director's office and she, you know, she's running this big several hundred person organization Mm -hmm. and she's very smart, very talented, but her priorities of data are obviously like, I had no idea what they were, right? They're completely different than I thought they were. And I think I said the term standard deviation to her. It was her my boss, our director of, of research and evaluation, and then me, all just the three of us talking. And I said, something, something, blah, blah, blah. And this had a really big standard deviation or small or something. And after the meeting, my boss just, you know, we walked down the hall to our research office. Yeah. We closed the door. So of course I panicked. I was like, <laughs> fired? What did I do wrong? I thought I just explained all the statistics to her really well. Yeah. And he was like, you're never allowed to say that again. Oh, wow. What? Standard deviation. That's like stats 101. I learned that in high school class as a 17 sure. year old. And um, he was like, the executive director has bigger things on her mind. Mm-hmm. Your job is to interpret the data. Yes. Yes. Not care how many decimal places there are. She definitely doesn't care if there's a little asterisk for statistical <laughs> significance. Oh, she doesn't care about things like effect size. That mm-hmm. is not. Yeah, to like yeah. what type of impact our work is having or not mm-hmm. in the community. Like you have to translate what you're doing. Don't ever say that again. And we were we were really good friends at the time mm. too. Like a really, really good boss. We've stayed in touch. 
And I th- he probably even joked something like, if you say that again, you're going to be fired. And I remember just being like, it was like I said a four letter word in the sure. meeting. I just, I, I didn't understand it first. I was like, why did I, what did I do that was so wrong? And I just remember having to think about it and think about it of how do I, how do I transition more into mm-hmm. interpreting and telling a story and not just, you know, here's the full spreadsheet of raw data, executive director, sure. good. Like that's what I was hired for. Yeah. And just kind of realizing that and embracing that more and more was, mm-hmm. uh, I could say I learned overnight, but it was a year long, multi-year long process. So, so it, it's interesting because I think I see that all the time. Um, and I still see that people um, will talk very technically about a bit of data. And I can see the business sort of sitting there going, oh, you know, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to phase out right now because it just doesn't make sense. And, I, and I'm often having to, to come and interpret. So when you, when you went from that moment of, you know, um, standard deviation or whatever you might have said, what were the things that you did in order for you to... Uh, transform yourself and bring yourself more in line with you know that the, and you use the term translator what what did you do to to, to start to you know do some self-learning and 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 get get on a you know a, on a point where you felt better about talking about data yeah well I was really lucky in that particular job because you know we had our own physical office or two offices where the five of us had our little cubicles But on the same exact floor, Mm -hmm. right down the hallway were the regular staff members, people grants, the finance and accounting people, although they're they're a technical group of their own in a different different jargon, but like still very um the social workers running the programs, the mental health counselors running the programs, the people doing these academic after school programs. And it was not difficult to do any type of you know sharing drafts or Mm -hmm. iterating realizations with them. It was really easy. I had lunch with these people every day. They didn't want to talk about data for lunch. They're not the lunch they're going to. They're like, and stop. This is this, you know, I'm scheduling meeting. Yeah. Um, I was, I would literally like print out two versions of the same chart. Okay. Really simple things like mm. is a bar chart and one is a stacked bar chart, like slight variations or mm-hmm. as vertical columns and one as horizontal columns. Like right. my own little, um, this is so nerdy, but it was basically, you know, research test of like, oh, you're in the treatment group. Let me test this. You, you were doing some kind of A-B testing on that. Yeah. Yeah. And I yeah. could just talk with them and I would show them both graphs and I would say, tell me what this means in your own words. Okay. The takeaway yeah. message here. Yeah. And I would watch their face because this was in person. And mm-hmm. I would see, like, are they pretending to get what I explained to them or do they actually get it? Can they actually say it? Mm-hmm own words. So it just helped me, you know, get 1% better every sure. single time. 1%, 1%, 1% of mm-hmm. I do graph titles so that they're understandable. How do I use dark or light colors? Sure. What type of, like, do I need decimal places or not? Should this be numbers or should it be percentages? Like all those little tweaks. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. That was, that was a really fortunate position to yeah. be in. I had yeah. to be able to do those conversational tests. You had your own live lab so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. And, and another yeah. challenge I see, mm-hmm. sorry. Um, no, 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 carry on. People, I see so many organizations, they'll spend weeks or months creating, you know, the perfect dashboard, yeah. Yeah. perfect such and such tool. Yes. But they've, they've never really tested it along the way and mm-hmm. get user feedback. And the person's like, I don't like the colors or something like really irrelevant, you know, but it just shows like the user is not really thinking deeply about the data mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. of course they're not, they weren't engaged in the process, you know, yes. you broke them in the very, very end. So mm-hmm. I think just that early rating and early conversations is so, so important. So based on that then, cause that's, that's interesting, you know, I, and I think it's, it's um, very well put in terms of how we generally find dashboards are beautifully put together but with no framing for the user, no real understanding of how they're going to engage with that. So what's the approach that you would take based on all of those factors to make sure that somebody is absolutely engaged, um, somebody understands what you're trying to, or at least that the underlying data around it. Um, and then, you know, so, so just take me through that approach and how you 
uh, either factor that into your training or when you're working with a client? Because I know you do more training now, but you used to, you know, you used to do more, yeah, not more, but you used to do some consulting. You probably still do. But, you know, how do you then take people through that? Um, and, and, and what are the, what are the steps that you would say are going to be absolutely important that cannot be missed? You are like the king of big, hard questions. Oh, gosh. <laughs> the question, you know, like, how do you design a dashboard that's actually good? That's an hour long conversation. Um, high level okay, steps, me, high level. <laughs> um, okay, I'll, let me think. I'll focus on one thing. Sure. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. This is the theme of today is all the challenges in organizations. Yeah. Yeah. I see people assuming that developing a dashboard is going to take forever and mm -hmm. cost a ton of money, that it's going to be this months long process. They have to purchase this new software program. They have to send their staff to training on this new software program. They have to like link all these data sources. Sure. Everything, they just think it's gonna yeah. be this huge process. Mm -hmm. So they think as long as this dashboard's taking forever, it better serve all of our needs. It better yes. be this audience and this audience and this audience just dump in all these graphs, all these data sources, and it gets so monstrous. Like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a one screen of the dashboard, I think should only have one or two charts at a time. Correct. Like, even even I agree. We're busy. We're yeah, distracted. Yeah. You know. Yes. Simpler the best. Yep. You'll cram in six, ten little charts, and then there's like a tab to go to the next sheet, and there's a ton more charts, and there's links to more things, and it's like. And because I think we're trying to serve everybody's needs at once with the dashboard. Sure. Yeah. So what I try to do in the beginning in a planning process mm -hmm. is it's really basic. Like who is this dashboard for? Yeah. 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 What about these people. And they'll say, well, it's for this person and it's for this person and it's for this person. I'm like, no, no, no that's like, that's three different dashboards. It really needs to be three, like three simple dashboards mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that actually get used rather than one huge dashboard. And that never gets used. Yeah. They get lost in it. Mm. Mm. Okay, so that's quite a simple approach then. How uh, and uh, and from that perspective, um, when you start to work with a with, with a, a a client or you're reviewing um, dashboards or you know reports, how do you how do you start to articulate um, the, the the best practice, what they should be thinking about in their organisations? Because you've talked about maybe a multi year project, but actually we know it can be. If you're doing it right in terms of getting the right information and understanding what the user wants, how do you then articulate or train those people in order to ask the right questions and, and, and you know, embed themselves in the process? Because they don't have all day to do that. You know, it's not, their, it's not their job. How do you get them to think in a different way? Is, mm -hmm. it, is it more data literacy or is it more just saying this is or is it explaining what data does? Another big question. Oh, I don't gosh. know. <laughs> you, try that. You, you tell me. What do you think? What do you um, have to do with groups? Yeah. So I think I think the, the the first thing that you mentioned I loved because that's what we that's what I would do. I would say, okay, who's going to use it? Um, and you know, okay, you're going to use it, but what question are you asking? And is that the right question? Is that really what you're asking yourself? Um, because many people will often ask a question, but and, and, and when you deliver it to them, said, no, that's not really what I want because I want something else. But then you say, well, so, so when we go beyond that, I typically say, well, what are you going to do with it? And then it sort of dawns on them that it's for a specific purpose. And maybe they have one or two options because I want to give that to them. I don't want to give them a, a straight, no, you can only do one thing. You've got to give somebody a uh, you know, maybe it's a decision tree, but but it's kind of like a a set of options, no more than two or three, probably no more than two, there where they can say, if I do this, this might happen, or if I do this, this might happen. So I think from my perspective, that's the the types of conversations we have, um, which then helps the business user or the the business person start to unpack what their challenges are in, in more of a uh, a, a pragmatic fashion rather than it being driven by a data analyst sitting there saying, yeah, I can, I can do that. I know exactly what you want because you're going to use this data and I can visualize it. No problem. You know, and they're visualizing it based on not much input. So I think that that's where we, uh, well, 
I, I, I have, I mean, I, some of the, you know, what you just mentioned there around having the, um, having the, 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 the dashboards with X amount of, uh, visualizations on them what one of my clients has you know showed me one of their dashboards which had 25 visualizations on one sheet and they had a scroll bar which just i said you got to can that immediately but that conversation when you say to them what what's the conversation that you normally have with them when you say that's got to go because they've they've invested time they've invested money how how, how does that conversation you know work and and it's it's a difficult one yeah, the, the more you do this work, the easier it gets because I can bring in case studies and sure. talk to them about, well, I worked with a similar foundation as yours and here was their challenge, mm -hmm. you know, whatever it was. They, they didn't have any data. They had way too much data. They wanted geographic data and how do we, you know, whatever their challenge was. And I can say, here's what we did and here's what worked in that process. So like, this is what I would recommend for you. Mm -hmm. and that sounds so simple because it is, you know, like for those people, they're, they're used to working in their office. Yes. What the office across the country or across the world is doing and having an external consultant come in and say like, I've worked with a dozen groups like yours and here yeah. is what tends to work and that people mm -hmm. tell me they find valuable. Mm -hmm. That's um, I think really helpful. And that's something that you can't, you know, there's no like magic textbook to teach you that or no university course. That's just mm -hmm. a lot of real world experience of just practicing and practicing things like dashboard development over time. Yeah. The, the, what needs to go, you mentioned that one is, um, that's really hard for people, I think, in yeah. practice yeah. to let go of graphs. So I, is Marie Kondo big in the UK? You know, the Japanese organizer who's all about minimalism. Have you heard no. of Marie Kondo? <laughs> she, okay, that's so funny. Um, I've heard of it. I've heard of her she, now. <laughs> she maybe had a net. She had. A, I think it was on Netflix. You have Netflix. Yes, yeah, I don't. Yes. Have Netflix, but okay. okay, okay. I think Netflix is. I, as you know, I used to travel full time. Yes. So I know streaming services aren't available in all regions of the world. But anyway, um, this is a technique I learned from a minimalist organizer. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're trying to clutter your closet you don't think about what needs to go. That's very okay. stressful. And okay. go, is people, we want to hold. Yes, we want to hold. Yeah. Humans yeah. are. Mm. So Marie Kondo has this technique, read in her book probably five years ago or something. Like if you're trying to declutter your closet, you lay all your clothes on your bed. You look at the sheer volume of it. And usually you're disgusted by how many unnecessary clothes you have because you realize you have way too much that you could ever wear and mm -hmm. you have a pile on your bed mm -hmm. and you don't think about well, what needs to be donated what needs to be trashed what can I sell at a consignment store like too stressful you think about what are the favorite things that I'm going to keep you know mm -hmm. what are the my favorite pair of shoes my favorite winter coat you know the best items and then later everything else goes so mm -hmm. I, I approach with dashboards or with all data in general sure. to work really well so we'll look at all their what did you say like 25 charts or 95 charts something? no it was it was 25 metrics on one page and it was scroll it was a scroll page as well so yeah that's even well, let's worse pre let's pretend there are like five of those yes they really matter or maybe yeah. ten. It's, it's a fraction it's not even oh yeah it's it, yeah it's some tiny segment of those are yes. ones that the leaders really care about so rather than saying, Here, here's your 25, you can only keep five. Choose 20 that have to go in the trash that we'll never see again. And I don't care how much time you spend on them, just let them go. Like, no way, don't do that. But think about, sometimes I'll even like, this is so old school of me. I'll like print out dashboards mm -hmm. of the group mm -hmm. just so we can circle, like sure. literally circle, you know, our pens. And yeah. I'll say, yeah. you tell me which ones are most valuable. Mm -hmm. Which have you heard your business leaders ask questions about. Maybe it's a clarification question. Maybe it's like, oh, do you have more data on this? Mm -hmm. This is intriguing. Mm -hmm. I need more info. Like, which of these do you think are more most useful? And it might be that they circle five out of 25. Well, then later we let the others go, but I don't I don't mention that in advance because sure. it's so, so yeah, long story short, focus on what you're keeping. Yeah. Rather than like, oh, you've got too much. You have to discard. Yeah. 
there's yeah. so much in this. And I think it's important, the questions that you asked there, because, you know, as you say, what is important to you? What are the key metrics that you're going to be using? Um, and then they naturally come to the conclusion of, oh, well, you know what? You know, we, we actually just only want to use those three or four. And I often, I often say to them, you know, literally, um, uh, let, let's just go with the top five. And, and even that gets scaled back. Um, because they, they start to realize that, oh, what, three and four are probably the same, so we can merge those or, you know, so it's interesting. So, you, you know, you, you so, so I, I guess you, you, you'd you call yourself a data visualization designer, right? Um, so what, what are the, what are, uh, if I was now beginning my pursuit in the world of data visualization, what would you suggest would be my pathway to, learning more about it and um, becoming quite proficient in, in, in that area. What, what would you suggest to people out there thinking about it? Yeah, I think a lot of us get wrapped up in tools. Mm -hmm. You know, we talked a little bit about tools so far, but there's so many tools available. Oh gosh, yeah. More being invented every mm. Mm. as all the companies like try to develop the perfect tool and get all of our money and all of our licensing dollars. And I think it's really um, stressful, daunting, mm -hmm. overwhelming for somebody entering the field to think, well, do I learn coding and learn R or Python or one of whatever, however many coding languages there are, there's gotta be at least a dozen or maybe more. Do I do the spreadsheet route and do a mm -hmm. sheet Excel? Do I do a kind of a drag and drop dashboard route, like a Tableau or a Power BI? There's also the more graphic design route, like do you specialize in Illustrator or yep. InDesign with the mm -hmm. Adobe products or even a publisher? Mm -hmm. Or I mean, I even use PowerPoint and Word for really great looking reports a lot of times. Yes. Those are all like so and I think I think we feel like we have to master all of them, and that's just not possible. So you'd spend your whole career just learning tools and as soon as you learn one they release a new version sure and it changes and you can't find yep. the button it's just it's impossible to master every <laughs> single yeah that should be a goal for anybody getting started with data mm -hmm. vision i usually recommend in 10 different tools you know watch watch a one hour youtube video on a demo on a tool listen to a podcast specifically about a tool in depth go to some conference sessions or a half day workshop, maybe on like one tool, like mm -hmm. kind of learn what's out there mm -hmm. and then specialize in just a tool. So, you know, I'm, I had this big crossroads maybe five years ago where I felt this immense pressure to go learn R. Mm -hmm. People in my field were starting to talk about R and I just, like, oh gosh, I'm going to have to learn to code. I don't have a coding background. I can write mm. tons of Excel formulas, but it's yep. uh, similar, it's bit, but, uh, yeah. you know, different from our code. Mm -hmm. I just felt so much pressure. Now I have to be a coder. And I just had to kind of let that go and realize it's okay to be a sheet expert. And, and even then with spreadsheets, like I'm a how to make graphs and spreadsheets person. I don't know all the formulas ever invented. Sure. There's, there's too many. They're not all relevant. So, um, yeah, just probably the first step to just getting started is letting go of this ridiculous, <laughs> ambitious goal that we have that I'm going to learn every single tool. I'm going to get certifications in it. I'm going to put all these skills in my resume, like just learn a tool and be very, very comfortable and confident with that. Great. I like that. And uh, let, let's go to something fun. Just because, in, oh, sorry. Go on. Um, Carry on. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I was going to say I've I've asked I, I, no, okay. I, I've asked you some very difficult questions, so let's just go to something fun. <laughs> um, I was really intrigued by your your story around upping and leaving and traveling the world as a digital nomad um, and uh, being able to do that freely. But that's quite a decision that you made. Just just tell us a little bit about you know where you were and and. I mean, that's a, a massive, massive decision to make in a, yeah, I think you've just, you just launched your own business as well, hadn't you? Yeah, I, uh, I've had so many just difficult business and personal decisions kind of all overlap all at once. So for example, you know, I just finished graduate school and then maybe a month later, two months later, decided to leave my salary job, my very good salary job 
very much liked and be self-employed. And then um, 10 days after that, my husband and I decided like, we should, we should have kids now. Like now's the time. Like we, sure. we didn't think we we're going to have kids. We changed our minds. So, you know, you're like building a business and figuring out what is this entrepreneurship, solopreneurship thing mm-hmm. and figuring out that's, that's very difficult. Yes. Well then, because I specialize in data and training. And like you mentioned, I did used to do a lot of consulting too. My time used to be more half and half mm-hmm. between the two of them. Now I focus 99% on training there's only one of me. I can only do so much consulting. Sure. I used to have yeah. more of an agency approach. That's mm-hmm. for another day. But um, the training, you know, pre-COVID was not all digital. There was a lot of in-person training. So it was very glamorous at first with no kids or with a kids to be like, a kid be like, oh, I get to fly to this city. Mm-hmm. And then two days later, I'm flying to this city. And then I'm flying to this city. And that was really fun for a while. Well, you add a second kid to the mix and now yep. we've got a third one on the way. And I just like, felt, I just wanted to be home for little moments. Like mm-hmm. I didn't want to miss, you know, reading stories. I didn't, I didn't want to miss any of that. So my husband, and I, I think we had heard on a podcast actually years ago, a couple that had sold everything and traveled. Right. And I remember thinking that's totally crazy. That's NA for my life and for <laughs> them, that that fit for them. Like that, that yeah. And for me, <laughs> little did I know that a couple of years later, I'd remember that that was a possibility. So we kind of started talking about this, like, should we live in an RV full time and drive around to campgrounds because we like camping? Well, that doesn't quite work because I need to be able to fly places really quickly. And then we thought, well, what if we, we can't really live in hotels because that would be cost prohibitive. Yeah. It, and, you know, so hotels are paid for if you're on a, a work trip, but you know, what about the in-between time? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So we live in Airbnbs full-time, which is actually really affordable if you do longer term rentals, like right. a week long rental or a month long rental. Yep. But this, this was not an overnight decision mm-hmm. because we had two kids. One of our daughters had just had heart surgery. Oh gosh. My mom had just passed away. My husband had oh, dear. been at his job. We owned house we we were landlords and owned another house outright that we were renting out the house that we just weren't able to sell and like keep hold on to we had a house full of stuff you know so it's not like you can just yeah get up and go yeah just just Mm. overnight so it was a it was a multi-year decision Mm. to sell Mm. almost everything and go wow we thought we were going to do it for two years but then you know surprise pandemic so it ended up being a year how did you transition from that, from the 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 the, um, the flying around, you know, the in live um, training and working with people side by side in a consulting mode? How did you, how did you transition from that through into this new world of COVID? Um, and what what did, what did you have to do to to completely change your business model? Luckily, I was always pro online from oh, the beginning. Okay. Mm. Um, some people laugh. I'll, I'm going to watch your face and see your reaction when I say this. But when I initially left the salary, I'm going to be a blogger and a YouTuber. Podcasting wasn't really a thing. It was kind of starting to be a thing. Sure. Um, I thought I want to be able to train people anytime. I want to be yeah. able to write a blog post that maybe they read it instantly, but maybe it's still helpful to them many years down the road. Or I want to record a YouTube video that people learn from any time, from any place in the world. So I had always embraced doing virtual trainings, mm. which is not usually the case. A lot of us prefer in person. Sure. But I had always kind of thought like, there's definitely a value to doing things yeah. online. So I had started doing online courses where it's, it's not just like a YouTube video and a YouTube video, but really doing more of a comprehensive curriculum and syllabus with activities mm-hmm. and live sessions. I had started developing those in 2018. Okay. So, you know, two years later, mm. 20, I mm. wasn't starting from scratch. Yeah. Luckily just built on that and built on that. So the that's transition fantastic. for me. Yeah, that's a great story. And I, I, um, I think it's quite brave for what you did, but you had the, you had the idea of moving um towards the online view anyway so which i think was was good foresight you know 
to do that. So now w tell me w what's, mm -hmm. what does the future hold for Depict Data Studio and Emery? You know, wh where are you going next? I'm pretty happy focusing on training. I'm happy to, you know, have a wide network of trusted colleagues to simply refer dashboard projects and report projects and slide mm -hmm. projects to. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to continue with online courses that I've been running mm -hmm. and you know, do a mix of kind of those that anybody can sign up for and the sure. private workshops. And for me, um, that's a perfect fit. And I don't, I don't feel like I need a big overhaul. It's working. Yep. It's enjoyable. Yep. Clients get what they need. So yeah, that's, that's that for however many, however many years that that still works. Who knows? I can't predict. I think there'll be a long, I think that will still be for there for a long time. I think we're still in this world where people, um, still struggle with data, you know, and, and what mm -hmm. to do with it and, and how it's going to help them uh, offer them the value that they need in their business. So uh, where can people find you? Yeah, so the best place to get in touch is my blog and my newsletter. So mm -hmm. I'm at depictdatastudio.com. There's a blog tab. I've been blogging for a decade. So there's several hundred articles from me, mm -hmm. from guest authors over time. A lot of them are software agnostic. Some of them are tool specific on sure. mostly Excel, a little bit of Sheets and mm -hmm. Tableau there mm -hmm. as well. And then I send out most, most every week newsletters with additional tips that aren't on the blog too. Excellent. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Thank you so much for making time to be um, my guest today. And I wish you all the best of luck for the future. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks.